Every story has a beginning, and for Sean Vincent Gillis, his was no different. Born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Gillis's early years were fraught with turbulence and distress. His parents' relationship was strained, marred by his father's battles with alcohol and mental health issues. One altercation was so severe, it nearly claimed the life of Sean when he was only a year old. After a stay in a mental hospital, his father cut all ties with his family, leaving Sean and his mother Yvonne to fend for themselves. Sean's mother painted a picture of a happy blue-eyed angel. But those who knew him outside the home saw something entirely different, a child prone to violent outbursts and strange behavior, like banging on garbage cans late into the night. As Sean grew, so did his disturbing tendencies. His late teens were marked by petty crime, alcohol abuse, and an unhealthy fascination with dead bodies and internet pornography. His obsessions often interfered with his jobs, yet his mother turned a blind eye, choosing to see only the boy she wanted him to be. When Yvonne moved to Atlanta in 1992, Sean was left to his own devices. Despite his worsening addictions, he managed to find companionship in Terry Lamont, a local bartender. But even the semblance of a normal life couldn't suppress the darkness growing within him. It was during this time that Sean committed his first murder, a chilling act of violence against an 81-year-old woman named Anne Bryan. This act marked the beginning of a decade-long spree of brutality and terror as Sean Vincent Gillis descended into the depths of his depravity. And so a seemingly normal childhood, marred by subtle hints of the monster that lay within, gave birth to one of the most horrifying serial killers in Louisiana's history. The birth of evil, as we might call it, was not marked by a single defining moment, but rather by a series of small steps into darkness. A troubled upbringing, a blind eye turned to escalating obsessions, and the absence of any guiding hand, all these elements culminated in the creation of a monster. A seemingly normal childhood, marred by subtle hints of the monster that lay within. Living alone, Gillis's obsessions took a turn for the worse. In the absence of his mother's watchful eye, Sean Vincent Gillis descended further into the abyss of his own dark compulsions. His interests, previously bizarre and disturbing, now became the foundation of a life that would soon spiral into a terrifying nightmare. The loneliness led him to the bottle, an old friend that knew him too well. Alcohol became his daily companion, a crutch to lean on when the darkness of his mind became too overwhelming. As the addiction took hold, his interest in the macabre side of the internet deepened. Hours turned into days as he lost himself in the gruesome world of internet pornography, his appetite for the perverse growing with each click. But amidst the chaos of his life, a glimmer of normalcy appeared. Terry Lemoine, a local bartender, fell for the troubled man. They married, and for a while, it seemed like Sean Vincent Gillis might have a chance at a normal life but the darkness within him was too potent to be quelled by love alone. His first victim, Anne Bryan, was an 81-year-old woman. A failed rape attempt led to a brutal murder, with Sean stabbing her 50 times. This act of violence marked a turning point in Gillis's life, a crossing of a line from which there was no return. This was not the act of a man driven by impulse, but rather a predator who had been waiting for the right moment to strike. His descent into darkness was complete. His obsessions had evolved from a passive interest in the grotesque to an active pursuit of the ultimate taboo, murder. Gillis's first murder was more than just an act of violence. It was a declaration of his surrender to the darkness within him. The act of taking a life gave him a sense of power, a perverse pleasure that was more intoxicating than any drug or drink. His first taste of blood was just the beginning. The descent into darkness was complete, and the path before him was now marked with the shadows of his victims. The man who once was Sean Vincent Gillis was gone, replaced by a monster who lurked in the depths of his own twisted psyche. With his next victims, Gillis's true nature revealed itself. As we delve deeper into the dark psyche of Sean Vincent Gillis, a chilling pattern begins to emerge, painting a picture of a man who was not just a murderer, but a predator. Gillis's modus operandi was methodical, almost ritualistic. He would stalk his victims for days on end, learning their routines, their habits, their vulnerabilities. Each woman was selected with a cold, calculated precision. He preferred those who wouldn't put up a fight, 
making his gruesome task all the more easier. One such victim was Catherine Hall. Gillis watched Hall from the shadows, biding his time until the perfect opportunity presented itself. Once he had her, he strangled her to death with a zip tie, a chilling signature he would use on all his victims. But death wasn't the end of the horror for Catherine Hall. In a macabre display of his perverse desires, Gillis violated her corpse before dismembering her and leaving her remains under a dead end sign, a cruel, sadistic joke that only he could appreciate. As the murders continued, the gruesome displays became more elaborate, more shocking. Gillis didn't just kill his victims, he mutilated them, turning their bodies into grotesque trophies. He even photographed his victims, a chilling reminder of their final moments, and a testament to his depravity. But it was not enough for Gillis to simply take lives. He wanted to dominate, to control, to instill fear. He saw himself as a predator, the streets of Baton Rouge his hunting ground. Each woman he killed was another conquest, another testament to his power. He relished in the terror he caused, the chaos he created. Gillis's thirst for violence, his need for control, his perverse pleasure in the suffering of others, all culminated in a horrifying display of human depravity. His victims were more than just numbers. They were people with lives, families, dreams. And yet, to Gillis, they were nothing more than prey in his twisted game. Gillis had become a predator, hunting the streets of Baton Rouge. In the end, his reign of terror would claim the lives of eight women, leaving a community in fear and a nation in shock. But as we will see in the next chapter, even the most cunning predator can't elude justice forever. As the body count rose, so did Gillis's depravity. With each passing murder, Sean Vincent Gillis's bloodlust seemed only to intensify. A chilling pattern began to emerge, each crime scene more gruesome than the last. His third victim, Joyce Williams, was found mutilated, her body dumped callously on the outskirts of town. His fourth, Lillian Robinson, met a similarly horrifying end. But it wasn't just the violence that escalated. Gillis's obsession with his victims extended beyond their deaths. He kept trophies, items of clothing, jewelry, even body parts. His home was a grim museum dedicated to his monstrous acts. And then there were the photographs. Gillis had a perverse need to immortalize his victims, capturing their final moments in a series of chilling images. As if his crimes weren't heinous enough, Gillis also harbored a grotesque sense of competition. He was not the only serial killer at large in Baton Rouge at the time. Derek Todd Lee, another murderer, was also terrorizing the city. But rather than feeling threatened, Gillis saw Lee as a rival. He kept tabs on Lee's exploits, as though their vile acts were part of some twisted game. The women who fell prey to Gillis were diverse in race, age, and occupation, but many were vulnerable, working in the sex trade. His seventh victim, Marilyn Nevels, was a 50-year-old sex worker. His eighth and final victim was Donna Bennett Johnston, a 42-year-old mother of three, whose mutilated body was discovered off Ben-Hur Road. Gillis's reign of terror had held Baton Rouge in its grip for a decade. The city lived in fear, and the police were desperate to bring the killer to justice. But as they would soon discover, the end was in sight. Gillis had become careless, leaving behind a trail of evidence that would ultimately lead to his downfall. The city was in the grip of a monster, but his reign of terror was about to end. In April 2004, the police made a discovery that would lead them to Gillis. In the aftermath of the gruesome murder of Donna Bennett Johnston, a significant clue emerged, a set of tire tracks. These tracks, left at the crime scene off Ben-Hur Road, were traced back to none other than Sean Vincent Gillis. The police, suspecting they were onto something, decided to pay Gillis a visit. Upon their arrival, Gillis, unperturbed, engaged in a casual conversation with the officers. However, the content of this conversation was anything but casual. Gillis mentioned one of his victims, Johnny Mae Williams, claiming to have known her. He said he used to hire her for house cleaning and even drove her around in his car. This seemingly innocent conversation was a turning point in the investigation. The police, now more suspicious than ever, decided to take a DNA swab from the inside of Gillis's cheek. This was not just an ordinary swab. It was the key that would unlock the horrifying truth about the man standing before them. The DNA sample was immediately sent for testing. The results came back and they were conclusive. 
The DNA from Gillis was an exact match for the DNA found at the crime scene. The police now had irrefutable evidence tying Gillis to the murders. The walls were closing in on Gillis, and he could no longer hide behind his mask of normalcy. The man who had once been described as a blue-eyed angel by his mother was now unmasked as a monster, a predator who had taken the lives of eight innocent women. The police moved swiftly and Gillis was arrested, marking the end of a decade-long reign of terror. His twisted fantasies, his brutal crimes, and his despicable acts of violence were finally brought to light. Gillis's reign of terror had finally come to an end. With his arrest, the streets of Baton Rouge breathed a sigh of relief. The city was safe once again, but the scars left by Gillis's atrocities would take a long time to heal. Gillis stands among the most notorious serial killers in history. When we think of notorious serial killers, names such as Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, and Jeffrey Dahmer spring to mind. Each of these men left an indelible mark on the annals of crime, just as Sean Vincent Gillis did. But how do their methods, victim count, and personal trophies compare? Ted Bundy, the charismatic law student turned killer, confessed to 30 murders, but experts speculate the true number could be much higher. Bundy was infamous for his manipulation and charm, traits that Gillis notably lacked. However, like Gillis, Bundy also kept souvenirs from his victims, a grisly reminder of their shared need to possess and control. Then there's John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, who murdered at least 33 young men and boys. Gacy's victims were typically lured to his home under false pretenses, then tortured and killed. This method of luring and controlling victims can be seen echoed in Gillis's own practices. Although Gacy's victim count is higher, the brutality and sadism of Gillis's crimes are equally chilling. Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee cannibal, was responsible for the deaths of 17 men and boys. Dahmer's crimes were particularly gruesome, involving rape, dismemberment, and cannibalism. Here, the similarities between Dahmer and Gillis become even more pronounced. Both men engaged in acts of necrophilia and mutilation, showing a complete disregard for the sanctity of human life. Each of these killers had their unique methods and motivations, but they all share one common trait with Gillis, a profound lack of empathy. These men viewed their victims as objects, dehumanizing them to fulfill their own perverse desires. In terms of victim count, Gillis's eight murders may seem modest compared to the likes of Bundy, Gacy, and Dahmer. But the sheer savagery and callousness of his crimes place him firmly among these infamous figures. Gillis's crimes may not be as well known, but they are just as horrific and chilling. The tale of Sean Vincent Gillis is a chilling reminder of the monsters that can hide in plain sight. This man, once a blue-eyed angel in his mother's eyes, descended into a pit of darkness that led him to commit unspeakable acts against eight innocent women. His journey from a troubled childhood to a notorious serial killer unraveled in a series of horrifying events that shook the Baton Rouge community to its core. Gillis's reign of terror, marked by a disturbing blend of violence, sexual deviancy, and a perverse sense of humor, has left us with many questions. What drives a person to such depths of depravity? Could his childhood have played a role in shaping the monster he became, or was there an inherent evil in him that was simply waiting to surface? His crimes were not just brutal, but marked by a chilling meticulousness. He stalked his victims, studied their habits, and chose his moment carefully. He took pleasure in his acts, kept trophies, and even seemed to view his heinous deeds as a competition. As we delve into the twisted psyche of Sean Vincent Gillis, we must remember the victims who lost their lives at his hands. Each one of them was a person with dreams, hopes, and a life that was cruelly cut short. Their stories deserve to be heard and remembered. Even as we grapple with the horror of Gillis's crimes, it's important to foster a dialogue about the factors that contribute to such monstrous behavior. Do you think Gillis was a product of his environment or was there something innately evil in him that was destined to surface? Could anything have been done to prevent his descent into darkness? Remember, your engagement helps us bring more of these stories to light. Don't forget to subscribe and leave your thoughts in the comments below.